And good evening. Hello, everyone. My name is Allison Dennis. I serve as executive director for the Sitka Center for Art and Ecology. And it is a pleasure to welcome you to tonight's spring keynote with Walter Katundu. Sitka is located at Cascade Head on the north central Oregon coast and resides on the unceded traditional lands of the indigenous people now represented by the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ronde and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. There is so much to learn. As just one step we can all take, especially when we are planning a visit to Sitka or the Oregon coast, we just encourage you to visit the Grand Ronde to Chalu Museum and Cultural Center, which is just such a vibrant place. Tonight's and now it is my pleasure to introduce Walter Katundu. Walter Katundu is a Tanzanian American multidisciplinary artist and educator. He creates sculpture, sound installations, and large scale public artworks that address place, history, nature, and community. Katundu also builds extraordinary musical instruments and mechanical devices when he isn't obsessively documenting the natural word world as a bird photographer. Katundu is the director of Katundu Studio, which focuses on the development and installation of public artworks. He received a MacArthur Fellowship in 2008, and tonight he is here with us as part of the Sika community. So please join me wherever you are, make some joyful noise, and welcome Walter Katundu to the Sika Center. Thank you so much, Allison. Thank you, everybody, for uh, the invitation to be here tonight and to share a little bit about my work and my, uh, my journey. My arts practice. Uh, I like to think that my um, art is a way of living my life. And I, I'm at the stage right now where I'm in a very fortunate position where I can ask my um, art practice to lead me into the life that I want to live. So I can say I want to be a person who's paddling around um, the coast of Maine in a kayak that responds to the sound, to the surface of the water. And um, I might not just get up and do that, but if I generate the idea and talk to the right people, the opportunity comes so that I, I get to be the person that does those things. So I feel very grateful and fortunate to be here with you tonight because of my art practice um, and to be able to share some of these ideas with you. And also I, it reminds me to, to thank my, my mom, who was a person who really created the space for me to be, um, to not only to be an artist, but to think of myself as an artist. I think a lot of, um, I think a lot of what makes someone an artist is the fact that they've given themselves permission to be in this space where they are navigating uh, the, the transformation from what's imagined to what's real. Um, and I'm going to share some images so we can take a visual journey here rather than um, than just an auditory one. So um, this, uh, I usually just leave this slide up in the beginning so that people can um, wonder what it is and then I move on without saying anything. But uh, <laughs> it was a project um, that turned into multiple projects. This bird stayed with me for a few years. Um, it was originally built for the um, an exhibition at the Oakland Museum. Uh, as you'll see, I'm very interested in uh, turntables and records, and I'm fascinated by the fact that there are these physical objects that have grooves. And if you zoom in on them, you recognize that there are little landscapes um, on these records. And I wanted to help uh, communicate this fact to people who are interested in records uh, and this connection to the physical and natural world. So I built this bird and connected it to a turntable so that if I turned the handle of the turntable, it would move the record backwards and forwards while also moving the bird up and down and backwards. So um, there was a kind of direct connection from a record to the natural world. And you'll see why that is um, an important connection to me as we talk about uh, my work and, and my trajectory so far. And I also wanna give a, um, a note of thanks to the people in my life uh, who saw something in me that perhaps I wasn't able to see at the time or wasn't ready to see. Um, and these these folks have entered into my life at all stages. Um, and I'm fortunate that they continue to do so. Um, and that sort of allowed me to step into these spaces to to create the work I have, to be in in the communities that I have and and um, later on to 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 think back and be grateful for uh, their generosity. So I, I'm going to look back a little bit. I'm going to take you on a little arc through um, my 
introduction to the turntable because I think it's important to think to communicate um, how an interest in one particular thing and then and then uh, maybe running it through a kind of creative prism so that I could see and imagine all these other possibilities related to one particular object. Um, that has really been a, a pathway forward for me, and it's created um, uh, chances to do more and expansive work, which might not be um, might not be something you'd expect from uh, someone who's starting out as a DJ. But um, I got introduced to the turntable in the early 90s, and I was really drawn to it because of its physical nature. Um, and I was able to to play in a hip hop band and in a live band. And uh, usually you're manipulating records. You're using these sort of recorded bits of history that have been encoded into the surface, and you're um, releasing them and recontextualizing them to make music. So I would play in the band, but I would play like a solo trumpet record or a, or a solo piano or voice. And I would sound like the fifth instrument on the stage. Um, eventually, I got a little bit envious of other, other instrumentalists' ability to just hit something and get a sound. And so I started to, to do that with the turntable. I would play it with chopsticks. And I found out that you could play the whole thing like a drum. If you turned it up loud enough, it would pick up those vibrations. And I think turntables from the time that they were created have been so good at picking up vibration and it's been considered an, an, an issue that's why people take great go to great lengths to shield them from vibration to isolate them to get the best sound quality but for me this thing that was considered a flaw is actually um, a way in so i was able to enter into this turntable and unlock its possibilities by embracing the thing that was considered um, problematic um, so here's a picture from back in the day you can tell it was um, a, a little bit farther back in the day than I care to admit. Um, but I'm playing the turntable here with chopsticks and I stuck a, a, a peanut can onto the cartridge. And when I hit that can with a chopstick, instead of hearing the thud that I'd gotten accustomed to hearing when I played the turntable, the note of the can rang out and was actually amplified through the turntable. So this was the moment where I realized, uh, wow, this, this instrument will also take notes and melodic material. Um, and it was a, a, a light bulb sort of went off and I started to build one and two and three stringed instruments that I would then tuck into the um, needle of the turntable. And as I played the strings, the needle was so sensitive that it could pick up all that sound and amplify it. And then I began to really instrumentalize the turntable to turn it into an instrument in a way that felt very um, uh, rich with possibility. Uh, after a while, I built so many uh, one and two and three string little instruments and that I called stylophones that I thought, why not just put the strings on the turntable itself? And I ended up building this. Uh, this was back in 2001. I built this phono harp um, and it had 26 strings. And as you pluck the strings, the vibrations would get carried into the body of the turntable. And when you put the needle on the record, it would amplify those sounds. Um, so this was uh, the beginning of quite a, a quite an investigation um, and quite a, a creative journey. Um, I started building lots of instruments. I'd have an idea every three months or so, and then I'd I'd think, okay, I, now I have to build this one. And I I didn't have a lot of money. I was a you know struggling kid in San Francisco, and I would just um, use a lot of scrap material and get all my turntables from the from the flea markets and. Um, I figured out how to do it by trial and error or trial and terror. Sometimes I would actually, um, you know, I, I blew up a couple of turntables in my living room by cutting wires and then plugging things in when I shouldn't have. Um, but those lessons you learn very quickly. And I realized that if I cut a wire, I should label it and then reattach it later on. And so I kind of um, stumbled my way through some of the technical things. Um, but I think it's important to, to recognize that I, I didn't really have a background in woodworking or electronics or um, in music. Um, I just had a background in trying things. And I was fortunate that the things that I tried created opportunities for me to try more things. You know, they resonated with people. And so um, I was, I, I, I admire, I guess I'm, I'm grateful to my younger self for, for um, having a kind of fearlessness when it came to to categories and again I think a lot of my creative influences creative influences have been um, people who've mixed up different things like I was into hip-hop and the the sampling culture is rich in hip-hop and um, sometimes when you take two disparate things and put them together the sum is unexpected and 
um, and opens up new possibility. So uh, yeah, being pay, paying careful attention to that process and working as I went as I went ahead. Um, I began to really investigate the world through the turntable. I, this was my way of understanding, of deepening my understanding with the world. And I, I'm, I often say that uh, the kind of adaptive reuse um, that's found in places all over the world where resources are scarce is a thing that informs uh, my practice. Um, there is a there is a line that you can draw from the 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 perils of um, colonialism and imperialism to those particular scarcities. Um, but I've, I've found that the level of artistry and improvisation and material intelligence that you find in such places is really profound. And it does inspire my relationship to art making. But I just wish that people were never forced into scenarios where a kind of sculptural improvisation is a mechanism for their survival. Um, so I've been asking questions of the turntable for a long time, and and it made sense that that if you were asking questions of materials, if you were having as as Hubert Diassi would say, a, a conversation with materials, um, it made sense that my questions were sculptural questions. So each one of these instruments that you're seeing is a is is a question um, to the strings and to the materials and to the possibility, saying what happens if I put this together, um, and then. You build it and it responds and you have to learn how to play that thing and three months later you ask another question and then you have to contend with this thing that you've brought into the world um so uh i was sort of turntable obsessed at this point you know just really thinking about thinking about everything i saw i wanted to put a record on it you know if i, I if i wrote up an escalator i think the handrail was wasting energy and i maybe could tap into that and make it spin a record somehow um, I really was thinking about the lens, the turntable as a lens through which I could um, understand and, and, and investigate the world around me. Um, so this is sort of the culminating result of all those conversations with wood and string and electronics. This is a phonoharp I built a few years ago, um, probably the most recent one. Um, and you can see now that my, my conversation with wood has, um, I, I, my vocabulary has grown. And now I'm able to have like maybe more prolonged and more interesting conversations with the material and and my aesthetic and my sense of the the craft has grown too through that through that practice. Um, and it's interesting with instruments. I'm only showing you the ones that really worked out. There's a lot of one, there's a lot of them that you build that just don't have that thing. Um, and even if you try to replicate something that you know how to do perfectly, there's a particular kind of magic with instruments where um, you can really know what you're doing and put it together and somehow it just doesn't sing. And sometimes uh, you can throw something together in a week and it ends up being the instrument that you use for years because there's some, some sort of chemistry between the parts that makes those things possible. Um, but just to give you a sense, I'll play a video here of what this instrument sounds like. The, the thing about uh, phonoharps is that you can use anything that's been pressed up onto a record. You can play them with mallets. You can play them um, with bows. You can do all sorts of things. So there's a lot that's possible. So I'm just showing you one sliver of what's possible with the instrument um, in this particular video. So I have looped the audio that I played in the chamber. Now I'm just playing on top of that. turntable you can use whatever's been pressed to the vinyl um, 
as a color or a texture of the music. So here I'm using a Japanese flute. So there's one example of what a phono harp can sound like, and um, uh, and I found that with a lot of the instruments, the more time you spent with them, the more they would sort of reveal or uncover what uh, what their voice was and what they were they were capable of doing. Um, so I I spent a lot of time outside at this point too because I I had a residency at the Exploratorium, the Science Museum, and my walk there from um, my apartment was about 20 minutes. But I was also very interested in birds at this time too. So depending if the birds were good, it could take me like three hours to get to to get to work. I spent a lot of time in nature, thinking about um, nature, thinking about tools, thinking about turntables. Um, and I would want to uh, I was just sort of taking in these things, not realizing at the time that they were going to merge. Um, and I was, given a book on birds of Northern California right at the time when I was starting to take pictures of them and this long dormant interest in birds uh, emerged. I was given a book by my grandmother when I was very young. And then I just started to take pictures of birds and finding any excuse I could to be outside. Um, and I started to think a lot about uh, the nature of the outside, about energy systems and ways of tapping into that energy in order to be able to play turntables. Um, but it also made me think about uh, other things that um, aren't generally questioned when it comes to, to the tools and the practices that I was working, uh, using in woodworking. Um, so I started to think about tool use in particular, um, about the values of things being straight and level and plumb in a workshop. Uh, and I started to think a little bit about the history of our interaction with um, the tools and materials that we use. And if you look out in nature, there's really, there's not a straight line to be found. Even the horizon is a curved line. Um, and what we've, uh, I, I'm using we in a, in, in a very broad way, but it's actually doing specific work. When it's, there's particular communities uh, do not have this particular relationship to the natural world, but but some some do and did, um, and some dominant communities decided we need to package, um, uh, make efficient uh, the the forms of the natural world. We need to make them stackable and shippable, and um, it would need to be efficient in ter terms of working with them, and then we need to be able to distribute them. Uh, and as a result, now we live in a very rectilinear world. The frames that we use for our images are rectangles. The paper that we write on, the doors and windows of the structures that we inhabit are rectangles. The tables that we sit at. Um, and I think that is that is a direct result of the fact that the tools that we've, uh, that, that were created to manage, I'm going to use that word in quotes, the natural resources or, or the, the natural world, uh, work best when dealing with rectilinear forms. And so I think what happens now is that when we begin to imagine something new, we think, I have these raw materials, I have a thing that I want to build, and these are the tools that I have. And you start to think through the possibilities of your tools. Because if you try to make something that looks like a tree on a, on a, on a table saw at the moment, you're putting yourself in danger because the tool is not designed to create organic forms and shapes. And if you try to use it to do that, it actually becomes a dangerous uh, tool to use. So it's encouraging you even through your physical safety to kind of conform and make these make these flat square rectangles, rectangular shapes. Um, I began to wonder like what would a turn uh, a, a, a table saw look like if the intent of that tool was to replicate a tree? Um, what would uh, what would a, a piece of paper that was circular um, allow for when you sat down to to write something? 
if you sat down to a piece of paper and you could approach it from any direction and you could begin in any space, what would that open up in terms of your own creative process or if you sat down to collaborate with someone else? Um, what would a society look like that um, didn't prioritize this sort of these sort of rectilinear ideals um, and sort of the management, but was able to think inefficiently to think like, you know what, we're gonna, it's, we'll recycle all the little bits that we have to cut off from the paper, but we're gonna move, we're gonna transition to a society that just uses round paper from now on because we value the possibilities inherent in that. Um, so I think principally that made me just realize that there are a lot of values and ideas and notions in our daily practices that we move through and assume are true without really questioning. And I think it's really important to question, and I hope that that's the role of artists, but I also think that's just a human, uh, part of the human condition. My daughter, who's seven, teaches me all the time that everything is open for question, um, and everything is open for like a creative interpretation. Um, so in thinking about all this, and also just being outside a lot, I, I, I want to also thank my the birds who have been my teachers. I spent a lot of time with them. Uh, they've taught me a lot about what it means to be an improviser. Um, and they've taught me a lot about the natural world and uh, my place in it and my connection to it. Uh, so as a result of being out there all the time, I ended up wanting to build things like this wind power turntable, where if you set it outside, it'll play your Nina Simone record on a calm day and take about three hours to listen to it. Or if it's really windy, it might take two minutes to listen to the whole record. So having to surrender your bit of control to have a particular experience. Um, and I started to build wind and water power turntables and other kinds of things too, just trying to tap into these energy streams and these systems that were available um, outside. And I built a lot of elemental turntables and then uh, was invited to do a piece at the luggage store gallery where I invited all the pigeons from Market Street into the gallery. I built this structure and we removed the windows and I invited the pigeons to come in and land in the structure. All the ledges and inside that you can see are weight sensitive. So when the birds would land on them, they would trigger turntables and sound elements inside the gallery. Um, the issue is when we opened it, nothing happened. The birds didn't come in. One week went by, no birds came in. I had all sorts of suggestions from everybody about how to fix it, like what I should adjust, what I should change, but we just waited. And about two weeks into the installation, this is the first bird that walked into the piece. And once they walked in, their friends joined them. And then every day after that, at around one o'clock, the birds would show up and they'd spend about an hour and a half in the piece and then take off. So the piece would come to life. Um, and my favorite thing about this work is that when we were done, we removed it and put the windows back up. And then for two weeks, the birds would return to the windowsill at one o'clock each day. And so we'd made this impression into the fabric of the natural world and um, the behaviors of the birds changed. I remember seeing a bird fly down the length of Market Street and then turn over my head and fly right into my piece. And I felt like I, I made it into this bird's consciousness, you know? Um, and so the fact that we'd made that shift and then when we removed it, it sort of remained this little bit of expansive space that then two weeks later got, got absorbed. Um, it reminds me in some ways about a, a process that I do when I teach my, my students. We, sculpture students, I often ask them to create an impossible, a proposal for an impossible project. Um, they have to propose something that is clearly impossible, but then they have to write a budget for it and do uh, renderings and do a maintenance schedule and like really think about it and handle impossibility in a tangible way. Um, and I think for a lot of students, it's really hard to do that. Uh, they run up against this, this threshold of impossibility and sometimes settle on things that are just very hard to do. Um, and then we try to figure out, can we make it socially impossible or physically impossible or um, financially impossible. Like what, what are the things that we can do that actually tri trip it into impossibility? And as we navigate this for a while, I find that um, students' sense of what's possible expands. And then our goal, just like with this, this sort of impression that we've made in the natural world, our goal with the students is to, is to settle into this new expanded space of possibility and then work from there for the rest of the quarter. Um, and I find that for a lot of the students, when we're done with with this piece, then when they move into their other projects, the things that felt really, really that felt impossible now just seem really hard to do. 
Um, and it's nice to have that expanded sense of, of possibility. Um, just a couple other images here of that piece on the on the inside so you can see what was triggered by the by the birds. Walter, did the first pigeon arrive at 1 p.m.? Any sense great, of what, that, what was special about? That is a great question. Uh, that That is a, a mystery to me. I think probably around that time. Um, it would make sense, but I can't. I can't say that definitively. Um, and what was special about that pigeon? I'm not sure. Like I think there's 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 one in every group. You know, there's somebody who's going to decide to step over that threshold first, uh, who's going to maybe uh, set aside their fear. Um, and clearly, it's a fear issue. It's like this brand new thing opened up. We don't know if it's a trap. If it's about you know if it's going to um, and we don't know what the what the outcomes are, but there was a step into it which created. Uh, and I, you could only see the pigeons through apartment door viewers because I didn't want them to be disturbed. So I wanted them to have the the privacy of their Market Street chaos, even in this little space. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure what made the bird special, but I'm also learning to be okay with mystery. You know, I love that question, and I love what that question evokes, and I'm okay saying I don't know. You know, I think there's a lot of space for that in, in, I think also in science and in engineering. It's really important to know what you don't know as, as a way of navigating because the things that we don't know are part of the fabric of our knowledge, you know? Just a, a heads up to those who are, uh, have joined just a, a little later. Walter welcomes your questions during the talk. So if you've got a question or comment you want to share, please use the chat or the Q&A and we'll weave in your, your uh, voice into the conversation. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'm going to go a little quicker because there are some big things I want to talk about. Um, this was a piece I was invited to do at the Headland Center for the Arts. And I'm just going to talk, I'm just going to say quickly that this, I hadn't built anything this big before, and so I couldn't lift it on my own. I couldn't move it on my own. And it, it was an important lesson for me that the you don't have to be able to lift the work yourself in order for it to live. Uh, a community of people came up around the idea and helped make it possible. So um, it's not something I'd, I rely on for every idea, but I was really grateful that it happened for this particular ocean-powered instrument. Um, so this is... Uh, a proposal image that I gave um, to this organization called C40 Cities, who does work with mayors, uh, uh, does, does work to fight climate change around, um, around the world internationally. And they wanted to award mayors who had, you know, enacted policies to fight climate change and, and, and to, to create a sustain, sustainable efforts in their cities with these awards. And um, I proposed that perhaps we should give them a bubble of air from before the the industrial revolution so how can we give them a bubble of air maybe these ice cores that fall in antarctica that trap the air so the air is like 300 years old or older and if we can get a bubble of that and put it into these awards we could we could remind them of what they're fighting for um so that was my proposal and um i ended up uh calling the national ice cores laboratory and asking for some decommissioned ice cores. And they said, who, who are you? <laughs> Why are you calling us? Um, they said, go to the website. You know, if you want to apply for something, you can do that. And I looked and it was like a six week thing to get the form and then maybe like over six weeks to maybe get an ice, get one of the ice cores um, as long as you were with an affiliated institution. And I only had four weeks until these were due. So I called and I called again. I made a, a pest of myself and then, um, Finally, they said, if you can find a scientist that we've worked with before, we will send you some decommissioned ice cores. And so I have that fabulous. So I rang up all the people that I knew and I ended up getting a, a connection to a scientist, a glaciologist. And uh, when I told them my idea, they were kind of, um, they seemed excited, but they seemed to be offering me these other, these alternatives. And I was very clear on the thing I wanted to do. Um, and eventually they they started to negate my idea and then to suggest that maybe um, I wasn't gonna actually do it. And then eventually said they didn't wanna be associated with false claims. And I was I took umbrage at the notion that somehow I would go through all of this and not actually have it be ancient air in these awards. 
Um, and so I think to shut me up, they 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 sent me to a, a more pre like a preeminent the paleoclimatologist in the field. Um, and so I contacted this gentleman named Ed Brooke, and um, he listened patiently to this artist who was like ready to take ice cores and and try to melt them in his bathtub with Tupperware and figure out ways of getting the ancient air. Um, he listened very calmly and patiently, and then he said, you know, I think I can get a couple of grad students on this, and we can work on it in my lab if you can come and visit. Um, this remarkable kind of night and day. Um, two, two people preeminent in their fields, very, very well respected and very capable, one of whom I think was very interested in efficiency and clarity, um, and I, as an artist, can be deeply inefficient. I can go the long way around in order to, to achieve a result. And so there was something that didn't quite fit there. And then the other who was very comfortable working at the periphery of his um, knowledge and um, you know, um, not very threatened by the work at all and ready to explore possibility. So um, this is me and Ed Brook in the, in the deep freezer. It's like minus 28 degrees in there. And he's showing me some ice core sample that ice cores that he had um, gotten from Greenland. Um, and to, long story short, the the ice cores from the ice core laboratory were were taken at a time when, in order to keep the holes open when they were coring the ice, they would pour um, uh, diesel fuel and another chemical down into the hole. So the the samples were really stinky, <laughs> to say the least. And so he said, "I've got some ice that I cored myself. Would it be okay if we use that in your project?" And it turned out um, the ice that he offered me was 12,000 years old. So saber-toothed cat times before the pyramids, these air bubbles were trapped from the atmosphere under fallen snow 12,000 years ago. And then um, as the snow, more and more snow fell, it compacted, turned into ice. And we have little bits of atmosphere from millennia ago trapped in this ice. Um, and he gave me a little sliver to hold in my hand and watch melt and like release all of this ancient air. Um, we were able to, to in his lab, to uh, transfer the air from the ice and it's a whole process. I'm happy to answer the questions about how it happened, but the air from that ice ended up being transferred into these aluminum stainless steel um, tubes at pressure without ever having touched modern air. Um, and then I was able to transfer them into these awards that I'd built. Um, and the wood was was all from trees that were older than the Industrial Revolution. So like everything was from, from prior to that moment. Um, and that little bubble of air inside here is 12,000 years old and it still never touched modern air. So I felt really good to give this to the mayors and the gentleman um, on the right with the red tie uh, it turns out to be the mayor of Dar es Salaam, which is the city I grew up in, in East Africa, in Tanzania. So uh, it was really nice to be able to make something for my um, for my hometown. Um, I'm right currently now, I'm at the Cal Academy, uh, the California Academy of Sciences, and uh, they invited me to do a piece um, as an Osher Fellow. So I've been an uh, Osher Fellow here for the last couple of years. And um, Initially, uh, I wasn't going to do anything sort of cultural or, um, I don't know, that's a strange thing to say because at artists, as artists, we kind of do everything we do moves in those ways. But I think um, uh, it was the summer of 2020, uh, George Floyd had been murdered and the sort of cultural reckoning of the moment was, um, was upon us. And uh, as I was invited that summer to be an Osher fellow and I was thinking, I didn't necessarily want to um, play into this idea that um, we'll get black artists now to come in and and do work to address the moment. I just thought, you know, I'm going to do something lovely, and it's going to have to be enough that I'm black. Like I, I don't necessarily have to come in and and speak to these issues for you uh, when you know there's a lot of work that has to be done that isn't necessarily labor that um, people from marginalized communities need to be doing. Um, but uh, when we walked through it, when we gave, they gave me a tour of the place, I saw African Hall, which is a hall of dioramas. Um, and there's something about the form that is st that stuck with me. I mean, the work is like stunning. The, the paintings are beautiful. The taxidermy is beautiful. But the, the history and the practice is 
problematic and and extractive. Um, you know, they used to go travel. Uh, we need some animals for the diorama. We'll shoot those two gorillas, and now we'll collect all the mineral and plant samples from this area. And then on top of that, they would set up canvases and they would paint the view. So not only would they take the animals, um, but they would also take the view, you know, and then extract it and then replicate it in this place to to educate and entertain distant audiences. Um, and so the, the people telling the stories and also the, the ways the stories were told has a um, uh, troubled history. Um, and so I wanted to address that and also this sense that it gives, it's like a very backwards looking um, a form. And there's often a sense that um, these these halls are often associated with uh, with imagery that talks about as as humans evolved, how they migrated out of Africa and distributed across the the world, but they always leave the sense that modern people left Africa. They moved off the continent, and there's a you know a billion modern people there now. And so I wanted to think about the cultural contributions and the lived lives and experiences of the people that that I know from um, spending my childhood there. Uh, and I felt a real absence, a real lack of of their presence in a in a space like this. So I I proposed to create a storefront that um, is a, uh, inspired by those in the Karyoko district of Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. So it's a reference to the type of stores that are found there. A lot of my memories, my own memories and associations uh, are used in the piece, um, and just trying to to address. Um, the the lack of their of this particular presence there. I just want to show that um, there's also a lack of specificity that of, often happens when people are talking about the continent. They say like, "Oh, I went to Africa," and people are like, "Oh, that's great, you're on vacation in Africa," but they don't say what country, they don't say what city or what village, um, and you know, people don't say like, "Oh, I had a great vacation in a vacation in West Asia," or uh, or sorry, East Asia. They'll say. I went to Bali or I went to Thailand and there's like a, a, specific, a specificity and familiarity with other places. But for some reason, um, the lack of specificity when it comes to the continent is generally accepted in, and particularly in this society. And so I wanted to be very specific about the details and about the place and the people. Um, and so created this piece that has a lot of very specific um, uh, pointers and stories. Um, and I was really grateful for their being open to the project and inviting me in. And I built it in Seattle while I was uh, in residence at the University of Washington in the art department. And then um, just got to know the storekeeper who isn't somebody that exists, but just in my mind. And she, what is she reading? A lot of like uh, African futurist novels and anthologies. And um, what's the history of, of her bicycle? And like, why is there, uh, why is there, why are there sewing materials underneath the table? Like all of these things that accumulate from a life lived and from those experiences I wanted to put into the work. And, um, when my sister was in Tanzania and showed my uncle a picture of this piece, he, he wanted to know where the store was. And I felt like that was like the, the best affirm affirmation I could possibly ask, you know, when it comes to the the nature of the work and the feeling of the work is that he was curious about where um where the picture was taken um there's a lot to talk about uh in relation to working with institutions and the shifts that they have to make and what it means as an artist coming in from the outside to problematize um these spaces and ask these sort of difficult questions um that can be that would be a whole talk in and of itself um this is a project uh, that has a kite that pa that pulls a string that unspools thread that plays records outside. And it's a piece called Upepo Mwewusi, which means black wind and um, in Swahili. And it's about being a black bird watcher and all the things that we have to, um, uh, all the ways in which we have to make ourselves legible in order to ensure our safety. So in one way, that can be a burden, but in another way, this particular project, it represents the burden of that, but it also claims space in a way where I'm, I'm in the world with a seven foot tall um, black kite and a turntable on my back um, as a way of not necessarily moving uh, in the ways that I might be expected. Um, Again, this is this is another long story, and uh, I realize I overpacked this talk, so I'm going to jump ahead to um, 
to a work that I want to share with you before we open up open it up for questions. Um, so this project here is um, I was really grateful to be invited to to um, create this work with the Muwekma Ohlone tribe in the Bay Area uh, in San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, the Alameda Creek Watershed Center is a new new um, uh, interpretive center that's opening up in Sonol, California. Uh, this is a, a project of the San Francisco Arts Commission, along with the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. Um, when they dug the, the the foundation for the built for the new building, they found people, um, and they uh, you know immediately halted and then realized that they needed to to address this issue, and so they called in the the Muwekma Ohlone tribe, who helped with the sort of cultural reclamation of processing the artifacts and. Um, and uh, um, thinking about like where to to reinter the the remains, um, it's a lot of like sad and and difficult and and uh, uh, sort of complicated and and complex work. Uh, but they uh, realized the land that they were on. And just quickly, I'll say that it's it's difficult. It's this is the the layers of complexity are that we live in a world where if you are digging the foundation for your building and you find um, remains that you don't necessarily have to say, oh, I'm sorry, we'll just build somewhere else. You know, there's this displacement of, of indigenous communities that has been happening like, through, throughout the history of this country that continues in a way, even to this day, even though they were able to bring the tribe in and work with them, um, work with them on it. But at the same time, the, the level of erasure that happened um, around the cultural erasure that happened um, in the in the twenties and and prior to that around language around access to history um, uh, is so complete that um, the these moments become opportunities for the tribe to have close contact with their ancestors to be able to actually like touch the artifacts and to understand the relationship of those artifacts to the to their ancestors in this in this place. So there's a lot of cultural richness and access that the tribe has. So it's a very bittersweet. It's very complicated and very layered. Um, so I was deeply honored to be invited to create a, a piece of work to commemorate the, the the tribe and to think about their not only their past but their future and presence at this site. Um, and this is a, um, a representation of Rukbaiwa, which is the, the eagle in the creation story of the Muak Ma'aloni. And it's sitting in a protective gesture, protecting the land below. Um, and there's also a sound installation um, in the gardens surrounding this particular work. Uh, it's going to be completed, I think, in about a month's time. I'm very excited about that. And I think it will be open to the public um, in the fall or early winter uh, here in the Bay Area. So um, I'll try to make sure that I post all of the things and let people know uh, when the piece opens up. Um, I have uh, a lot of detail to go into about this particular work. And I also have another project that involves um, partnering with volcanoes to produce um, large scale records of the stories of local communities. Uh, but I, both of those things would also take a bit of time to to get into. So I'd like to check in with you and see what questions you might have, and we can talk about that. And if there's some interest in either expanding on this project or in talking about the volcano project, I'd be uh, more than happy to do that too. While people are uh, collecting their thoughts, uh, do you start a partnership with the volcano in the same way that you do uh, uh, an ice researcher? What's the how do, how do you find <laughs> yeah, the right there are many different kinds of many different kinds of volcanoes? That's actually true. Volcanoes have different personalities based on um, the geology and uh, the chemical makeup of the lava. And um, so I think you start by listening. Um, and I think most of these things are most of my way of working is to is to attune myself to the important things in a in a place. But the birds have taught me that if you um if you listen, uh, birds are really the best bird watchers. So if you watch one bird, they'll show you what all the other birds are doing. They'll show you what's important to them, where the food is, where the threats are, and then you can understand the landscape in a different way. And so the thing to do is to show up and and I guess just pay attention and listen. 
and um, and then res and then respond and have the work be a response. Um, so uh, yeah, I'd say the the volcanoes, and then I'm I'm pretty sure the volcanoes are going to have unpredictable answers <laughs> to, to my questions. We've got a, a question about uh, more instruments using natural elements, and then uh, there's a lot of interest in the volcano project showing up in the in the chat. Okay, um, could you uh, rephrase the, the instruments? Yeah, it's a, it's a question about uh, more instruments using natural elements. If there are other, uh, I'm just uh, uh, oh, guessing. Yeah. Or I've made um, uh, wind-powered ones, like I, oh, I've showed you. I've made water-powered ones. I've made a, I've designed a runoff rainwater turntable that would sit on the curbs, sort of like mailboxes, all through a city. And then whenever it rains, the, the runoff rainwater in the street would spin up a wheel, and they would start to play music all over the city. Um, Earthquake-powered turntables that would have a record on them that was only be meant would only be meant to be heard in the moments after an earthquake. Um, I'm really interested in not, um, I feel like as audiences, oftentimes we feel entitled to a particular experience and I like disrupting that a little bit. Um, I like maybe not sharing what's on the record and people just having to wait until the earth moves in order to be able to hear it. I think there's something to be said for, for stepping back and, and shifting our sense of time and, and pace when it comes to the, the artistic experiences that we're trying to um, have. And if I can, I'll just jump ahead here to the um, to the volcano project, because it is about that in some ways too. Um, and it's also a kind of a full circle. I started off with the turntable and thinking of it as a little piece of, you know, geology, you know, little little landscape. And now I'm asking the landscape to to make a to make a record for me. And so this project will take place in in volcanic regions like Hawaii or northern Tanzania. There's a mountain there called Oldoño Lengai, or in Iceland. Um, and I'd work with local volcanologists and uh, locate appropriate installation sites, and then collaborate with um, indigenous and local community members to record their stories and songs in the lava fields at those sites. Um, then we would engrave recordings into these enormous 10 foot diameter records and then generate ceramic molds from those records that we could uh, install um, into the landscape in, in collaboration with local environmental and community organizations. So uh, then we would just wait. And at that point, you have to just wait for the earth to respond. And it could take two weeks. It could take, you know, 50 years or three months or so. You, never, you just never know. Um, but once the once the the volcanoes erupt, the um, the lava may inundate the sites, and it would basically um, cast itself into the shape of these records. And then once everything was cool and we could excavate these boulders, we would have these large stones that we could install on purpose built, sustainably powered turntables in accessible locations, so that the communities could then hear, see, and hear the stories that they co-authored. Um, with the landscape. Um, there's a lot of research and development in this particular project. Um, I'm applying for funding for it right now, but there's a lot of like extensive material explorations and prototyping. Um, I'm in the phase right now where I'm sure I'm going to run into the scientists who uh, are interested in efficiency. <laughs> and I'm, I'm interested in like, this could take two generations to actually unfold. Um, and uh, I'm in that moment where I'm ready to to take out the Tupperware and the ice cores and the bathtub. It's all like very cursory, very beginning um, ideas about how to do it. And I'm sure there, there are volcanologists out there who will say, you can't do it because of this, and this will be a problem, and this will be an issue. And those things are all part of the creative landscape. I'm super excited about those those problems because we can find ways around them. And almost all of those things are surmountable in one way or another. You can design a way around them. And then if you can't, then that's just a, a, like a thing that you've learned about the process of this particular piece that you have to navigate and, and sort out. So I'm open to all of that and really excited to make this happen. Um, the other thing I think is important about this work is that uh, for me is that it's, you know, I started off with turntables and now it's culminating in 
like a collaborative community work with storytelling, with the research phase, working with volcanologists, with 3D design, sustainable energy, public art. Um, I have to invent new ways of encoding and also extracting the sound from the records. Um, I think stories that we write are often written in response to the natural world rather than in a dialogue with it. Um, so we have to let go of our familiar expectations of control. And then really, really what we're doing is creating the parameters for an interaction whose scale and duration are essentially unknowable. Um, and I think when you're applying for funding, this is interpreted as a risk. <laughs> um, the idea, but it's central to the artwork's aim of, um, of recalibrating our sense of time and our relationship to an actively changing planet. And I think it's important now, I think, more than ever, um, to invite the land into a meaningful, to be a meaningful contribute, uh, contributor to the work, um, and then ask the audience to attune to the pace of the land and to learn. And I think if you think of the land as having a voice, what does that do to your sense of, um, to your sense of the land as a whole? Like, what does it do to your, your relationship to it if you think of it as having a voice? Um, and how then will you think about it in the future, your particular interactions with it, how we care for it, our policies in relation to it. Um, I think this piece has a lot of um, potential to address a lot of different um, issues. And the fact that uh, I'm just open, it's like walking into a landscape, into, into a new forest that I've never been in. Um, I feel like each work is a little bit like that. You step in and and the work is built from the experience of paying attention and like uh, being in conversation, respectful conversation with those spaces. I've got a question that goes back to the, uh, the, the turntable. How do you select a recording for an exhibit? Does it have a message? You've been talking some about uh, music that you yeah. create, uh, but uh, just uh, when you're making a, a choice from from your music or the music of others. Yeah, uh, oftentimes it's aesthetic choices uh, related to this mix of different sounds and how, like, what's the new possibility when you when you put them together. Um, I use a lot of uh, jazz records. Um, I think there's a, something about the spirit of improvisation and possibility in in the, in that musical language that I really resonate with. Um, but I think the the Thing that I prioritize is not necessarily like the the name or the recording, but the the fact that like you can use records as a, a medium for sound, like a direct medium for sound, not just a way of storing sound information. And so I wanted to use the turntable as a as something that I could send sound through, and then as needed, be able to pull sound from records to contribute to these compositions that I was creating. Um, but the choices are really up to like, what does it contribute to the like aesthetic qualities of the final song? Um, and what sort of surprises are in store? I think I'm, I'm really interested in mixing things together that, uh, that create things that feel unpredictable um, as a way of learning about what's possible. Got uh, another question. Making art to solve impossible problems is perhaps what we all need to learn to do in order to face the future. Do you have a reaction to that idea? Uh, I think it's a great notion. Um, I think it's true. Uh, I also think that we all have this relationship to navigating um, this journey from what we imagine to what's real. I think we we have the capability, we have the the tools for it. It's socialized out of a lot of us to think that we're not artists, we're not creative. But I think that um, just like every black crown night heron I've ever seen has this incredible presence and like right to be there. I realize that we have these innate sort of um, potentials within our within us. And I think it's we're social it's socialized out of us in some ways. I think schooling, um, you know, you hear about the the um, these fabulous teachers on occasion that are like holding it down and saving <laughs> saving kids' lives and creative futures um, in the sea of um, of uh, like problematic institutions that that are thinking about like creating workers rather than than creatives. And I think if we all, I think it's probably um, 
inherent in the, the particular political and social system that we live in that not everybody uses their uh, creative potential to the fullest because I think if we did and we were all thinking about possible futures that currently feel impossible, then things would shift and societies would shift and I think those in power would be um, would have to deal with the discomfort of those changes happening. Um, and I think that is seen as, as a risk. So I think we all have it within us. I think we all should do it. I think we should foster that in our in our in our kids and and in our elders. Like we're never too late. It's never too late to to shift our perspectives about the world. Um, but I think artful thinking is something that we all have and that we should all engage in. There's a, a long description in a, a question that's in the Q&A. I'll just uh, summarize. It's someone who's working on some uh, community-based work. They're working on a zine around social justice issues. And kind of the core of the question is, I'm intrigued to hear about how to bring diverse people together, how to grow such a project to be more inclusive, take it to the streets, collaborative beyond the flat page or screen. Uh, so does any advice you have about when you're doing community-based work, bringing, bringing people in, having uh, uh, public work be inclusive? Yeah, um, I think, uh... I think, I mean, it's, it can be down to something as small as just even the word inclusive, like including into what, like if we bring somebody into a system that isn't like, isn't benefiting them or has some toxicity towards a particular community, like what does it mean to then have them navigate those spaces? So there's, there's sort of that layer of complexity, but I think the, um, the thing to do is to, is to be earnest and to, and to do the work and to have the conversations and be open, um, and to realize that, uh, um that that um these are conversations that have to happen that are never one-sided this idea of of outreach or like bringing people in or moving out to to attend to particular audiences has a feeling of a one-sidedness of like a um a kind of um control where the variable is 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 all of of them or the other people and i'm not saying that to to insinuate that that is the the questioner's intent at all i feel like i feel some real genuineness and care in the in the phrasing of the question um i think if you're earnest and you spend the time um uh, I think the 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 trust and the and the possibilities inherent in those relationships and communities uh grows um, but you have to be, um, you have to do the work rather than just be seen to, to be doing the work, which is something I just recently heard in a, in a Baldwin um, uh, uh, speech. Um, there's a kind of tendency within institutions to need to be seen to have done the work rather than to continue to do the work, because I think doing the latter, actually doing the work is, um, creates a kind of friction and discomfort, which is actually essential to, to progress. Um, and I think without more specificity, uh, it's hard to answer that question like completely directly, but I think uh, honesty, earnest, earnestness and respect are critical. And I think intention is rarely enough. Uh, we'll just do uh, two more questions. Uh, did you ever have a moment in time when uh, where you started identifying more as an artist rather than a musician or a DJ? Uh, yeah, I was an artist from the beginning, thanks to my mom. Uh, and I dabbled in um, music, DJing, birding, kite flying, um, engineering. Um, I feel really grateful that I've always seen this as my practice i've always seen well, i was told always to focus as a kid you gotta focus like pick something and do it and um i felt bad about that for the longest time and much later in life i realized that my thing is doing all of these other things and drawing connections between these disparate um approaches and, and media and um I think it's really important to uh, remember that this is never taught in school. The arts are always on the out. They're they're an addition. They are um, they're something that's not not necessarily prioritized. And what I have found to be true is that as an artist, I get to be an engineer. 
I get to be a bird watcher. I get to be a kayaker. I get to um, do historical research. I get to work in community. I get to um, have a wonderful tour of the collections in here in the Cal California Academy of Sciences. Like art encompasses all of these different fields in ways that are are um, really revelatory, and it's such a privilege to to be a to finally like. <laughs> Also, personally, understand that um, art is a thing that allows the possibility of of, of having the the, mul the multiplicity of experiences um, and and uh, set, like ex expertise um, that I wouldn't have had a chance to access otherwise. And it feels like a real gift to have been given license and permission to be an artist because now. As because I'm an artist, I get to be multiple things, and I think we're all multiple. I think we we are all multiple things. We learn to focus. We learn to dedicate ourselves to certain things. And I, for one, am very grateful that the engineers who designed this building dedicated themselves to doing that well. So um, I think there's there's a, but I think there's also a way to be an artful engineer, to be an artful scientist, an artful um, uh, community leader, uh, and I think. Uh, I'm grateful that I get to do it in the practice of like wondrous experiences, um, but I really hope that people get to feel and and practice artfulness in their daily lives. Otherwise, one of the uh, not impossible but improbable projects Sitka is uh, working with many others uh, on right now is how do we. Uh, bring art into rural schools and uh, classrooms and, and kids' lives, especially in uh, rural Oregon communities where there is no art program or uh, the art programming is extremely uh, limited. So just taking a lot of inspiration from this talk. We'll just uh, uh, close okay. with one last. Oh, go, please. Go ahead. Oh, I just quickly wanted to say, too, um, that it's also important to recognize that we live in a particular um, society uh, that is set up in such a way that the risks are real to people who may think of art as being indulgent, because um, if they if they don't have the space to be able to sort of pursue and take time and be patient in in pursuit of a particular creative practice, it could mean um, it could impact their well being, you know, and their health and their livelihoods. And so the idea of um, of like buckling down and doing a particular thing that seems outside of art can feel very important. But I think the important thing to note is that art is important in those pursuits as well. And also it enriches and, and increases your capability to do that work well too. So I think there's a fear that somehow art is a distraction or it's stepping aside. But I found that every time I've felt that I was being distracted, it was just my imagination trying to tell me something. And every time I've done that, I've ended up back at the thing that I was doing uh, better for it. Uh, close with this is a, a future looking question. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a project uh, that you have in mind now where you're the pigeon not quite ready to pass through the <laughs> door yet? Are you are you uh, standing looking in at the, on the outskirts of, of anything that you can describe? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, uh, part of that is. Um, just life and and uh, parenthood and um, uh, I'm about to turn fifty, uh, so I'm about to cross over that particular threshold, arbitrary or not. It is a kind of like stepping into the future and thinking about what I can do with what I've um, brought with me so far. Um, and there are public art projects that are at scales that um, I haven't encountered or, or stepped into yet that I feel. Uh, capable of doing, but I have a tendency, and I've had this tendency, I think, for my whole um, uh, practicing life, uh, to do things that I don't really know how to do yet, because I need the experience of doing the thing to be, to to teach me, to show me what I'm capable of, and I feel like if I know how to do something, then um, uh, it's a kind of process of manufacturing of just creating the thing and putting it into the world and i'm really interested in in working at the periphery of my understanding and knowledge so that i'm kind of pushing into the spaces the unknown and tangling with that in a way that uh, when i'm done i've sort of built new ground you know 
Um, so to answer to that question, uh, maybe it's a feels like an escape from the question, but it's life, you know. Walter Katindu, thank you so much for spending this time with us, sharing your work with the Sitka community. Uh, it's just been uh, an inspiring and thought-provoking and challenging and uh, backbone-building uh, uh, talk. So grateful uh, to you. Thank you, Sitka community, for uh, turning out and look forward to seeing you back here uh, when our talk series resumes this fall and winter. Thanks so much, everyone. Good night, everybody.